One of the things that we do in our, and other duties as assigned is to regulate bottled water transport, bulk water transport, and spring water. Um, part of Scott Whitney, who I think is probably in here somewhere hiding in the back, and part of me are the drinking water program staff who worry about that. We occasionally rope other people in when we can get them to slow down long enough. But um, this is basically what we're talking about. If you move more than 10 gallons of water across town lines, you need a bulk water perm transport permit. And the reason people are willing to do that in general, because it costs money to move water, is because that water can be defined as spring water. So when we get a bulk water application, we're looking at it for a variety of reasons. And you know, we'll talk a little bit about all of those and try to explain how we fit under the, the federal definition that you all heard this morning and that preempts all of our state regulation and guides it. So in order to actually transport water in over 10 gallons, unless you have a, a, an exemption, which lots of folks do, including public water suppliers, because they have to occasionally for emergencies, and people hauling water for swimming pools, and well drillers, and a few other people. But if you want to transport bulk water, you must meet four criteria. And the one that we care most about is that it not be a threat to public health, safety, or welfare that the water be clean and potable, you know, because you're selling it to people to drink, and that's, we don't want to poison them in the process. The one that's most interesting is that it not be naturally available at the point at which it's to be transported. Now, you know, in Maine, we get four feet of rain a year in a good year, and three feet in a bad year. It has to be the kind of water that you want that's not naturally available, and that's what most of this is about. Um, the substantial hardship piece ends up being an economic hardship, generally speaking. The last one um, was added fairly recently as a result of some legislative action, and that's that we can't have an undue adverse impact on the waters of the state, and either by itself or with other withdrawals. So this is as close as we come right now to regulating water withdrawal. So we we farm out a lot of this work. There are only 32 people in the drinking water program on a good day. And so we ask for help from our sister agencies. And the main DEP, the Geological Survey, the Public Utilities Commission, and all take a look at, at the data that's submitted. And then we try to pull it all together and decide whether or not it meets those four criteria. And if it does, we ask our commissioner to sign a, essentially a waiver because it's prohibited except by waiver. You're not supposed to move it without this. So, but what we really care about, our core function in life, is to implement the Safe Drinking Water Act, which is yet another federal piece of legislation. And our goal there is primarily protect public health and safety. We want drinking water to be safe to drink. And you know, bottled water is a subset of drinking water. It was rightly pointed out this morning, it's one of the few subsets that's almost always drunk. You know, maybe by the pack rather than by the person, if you're a little fanatical. But very few people flush their toilets with bottled water. So, you know, we, we, we have a, a high usage rate, we want to make sure it's good. So we check it for water quality, and John has foreshadowed nicely some of the water quality we check. We do a hydrogeologic evaluation because we want to make sure that the spring is adequately protected or the, the source is adequately protected. Um, we also look to make sure it's labeled, and we work with the Department of Agriculture on that, that it's labeled accurately. And then Scott takes a look at the facility design to make sure that that facility will produce a, a clean and safe product. So, you know, this is the, the piece that I care most about, the source. This doesn't happen to be a spring water source. It's a public water supply, but it's a nice picture, and <laughs> it's handy to obviously a surface, a, a groundwater discharge area, and you might actually be able to convince somebody that this was spring water if you did the right hydrogeologic studies at it. Now, as, as you heard this morning, and I, I suspected you might, but I left this in here anyway, the Federal Food and Drug Administration, after at least half a dozen years of long and painful discussion, came up with a definition of what spring water was. And that definition was a compromise between two polar opposite groups, one of whom 
wanted spring water only to be collected where it naturally flowed from the ground as a spring. And the other of which felt, for a variety of reasons, part of those being sanitary protection, that you were better off drilling a well or a borehole near the spring and collecting the water there. Now that's the way the FDA ended up going. You can still technically collect the water as it flows naturally from the ground and call it spring water. But the sanitary problems with that are fairly significant. As soon as it bubbles out, you've got a lot more ways you can get it contaminated. So we review under the FDA regulations whether or not the water that's withdrawn actually is hydrogeologically and geochemically connected to an identified spring. And the piece of this that is probably most interesting in an environmental sense is that you can't dry up the spring by pumping from the borehole. If you do, you no longer have an identified spring, so you can no longer market it as spring water. So as your demand goes up, you have to spread your net ever wider and develop more sources, which is exactly why we are having this many people in here, because Nestle is having to spread their net wider and develop more sources as they become more popular and have more market success. Because if they could have stayed at Poland Spring and gotten all the water they wanted, they would never have been trucking water all over Maine. But that's a finite resource just like any spring water source is. Uh, we try to coordinate. You know, the, the state works really hard at, at doing things so that we actually are both effective and efficient at our reviews. Um, we, we work pretty hard at, at making sure all the geologists at least get together and go look at the spring. The, the problem we have with all this is that there, as I indicated earlier, there aren't a lot of us and we're trying to do both good and effective work to you know, make good decisions on behalf of the people of Maine and it would be nice if there were a bunch more of us to do that. There is also, and I know Bob Marvini isn't around today, so he can't defend himself, an ongoing review of groundwater withdrawal regulations that may or may not result in a wider net of permitting for groundwater withdrawals. We, we're at the, the, that group is at the state right now where there's about five options on the table ranging from do nothing to do everything, and they're all equally plausible. But sometime before next winter, that group is supposed to come to a conclusion about whether Maine's groundwater withdrawal needs regulation, and if so, on what level and by whom. Uh, in the meantime, we are regulating bulk water transport, which, if you look at the last water withdrawal report, is a very small piece of a very big pie. But we're regulating it because we are told to. We, we've issued some draft guidance for how to do hydrogeologic evaluations of spring water. Um, and again, we're trying to make sure both that it's safe and that it's accurately characterized. And that then, once that test is passed, that we have the information so that we can manage it well and that the, the applicant can manage the extraction well over time. Because if, it, although it is in their best interest to be sustainable, the, the temptation to not be sustainable because you have short-term demand is fairly significant. So we're working on how we can best monitor the process to make sure that, you know, that when you're assuming that you have a spring, you have a bulk loading station, that you're keeping an eye on the, the, the quality, the quantity, the yield of the spring, everything that goes on around it. We know that for the folks in Lurk territory, the permits are, are tight enough that that's going to happen. For the rest of the world, we're still working with DEP on how best to have reasonable levels of regulation that aren't a burden to people, but help them do the right thing. So it's, um, it's never a dull moment. Mm -hmm. uh, we're importing to Framingham, Mass, and to other places out of state. Obviously, they can have an unlimited market depending on how much we're going to give them. I mean, we could give our state away and they would still not meet the demand when they're marketing to the world. So, I mean, isn't that waiver a little unrealistic? You'd have to ask the legislature. <laughs> they're the ones who said, if it's not naturally available and it's an undue hardship <coughs> and it's environmentally sustainable, and whatever the fourth one is, I'm, I'm losing myself because I was doing them backwards. If it meets those four criteria, it gets a waiver. Um, I, I agree with your point, and it's well taken, that although Maine has a lot of water, the quantity that's available from any one spring is finite. 
it's, like, it's, it's very much like cutting trees. You, know, you can cut trees in a way that they grow back again and you still have a forest, or you can clear cut it and turn it into a subdivision. There is a, there is a limit to how much you can take from any one place, and knowing that limit is an art right now. We use science to get there, but it's an art. And we will not supply the whole world with water, even though we have a lot. We don't have that much. <laughs> Maybe if we could use the Saka, we could. It's a meta-annual report. Do you know who is reviewing that report on an annual basis? 